Uh, well, thank you uh, all for coming. Uh, this is uh, the inaugural uh, Evenings at Whitney for the fall of 2022. It's good to see people in person. And for all those people in the Zoomosphere out there, I don't know where you are, but um, thank you very much for participating with us. And um, it's my uh, really special uh, pleasure to introduce our two speakers for this evening. Uh, both of which, uh, this is a postponement, as you might imagine, from uh, the, the, the pandemic. Uh, they were supposed to have come here a year or a year and a half ago or something like that. And, you know, um, stuff happened. They were patient enough um, to stick with us and come out here. Uh, but uh, Michael Lazardo and Sneed Prinz are here to talk about the evolution of the COVID uh, pandemic, and I think it's going to be uh, an extremely interesting and relevant uh, uh, presentation for uh, all of us and for the future, our future understanding. Um, and just as sort of a way of introduction, uh, Michael, who's wearing an Aloha shirt, I have to say he's very well dressed uh, because he has, uh, he just came from Hawaii uh, last year, and so, uh, or last week, last two week. like two weeks ago, or a week yeah. ago. Anyways, uh, Michael is the deputy director for the Emerging Pathogens Institute at the University of Florida, which, if you don't know, is probably one of the country's uh, most premier uh, institutions at understanding uh, emerging pathogens and pathological diseases. Uh, and Cindy is actually a, an associate director of education and epidemiology at UF Shands. Is it Shands or the medical school? I should know this, but public health. Yeah. Ooh, so there's your good test of your microphone, right? So I'm assistant dean of um, educational affairs and then also an associate professor of epidemiology. And I'd like to turn the lectern over to our speakers. Great. Thank you. Thanks. A, a very generous uh, um, introduction. So thank you very much, Marge. And so uh, we're going to tag team this, and I'm a little bit of background in terms of expectations. Going to talk some science. Um, practical side of, um, I'm coming in and out. Are you guys, you okay? Yeah, so just a little bit of practical side. More like what our response is, how the virus evolved, how it came. Surrounding communities with the idea that that would be a good way to sort of explain how we dealt with the issues related to testing. How do we develop tests? Um, how do we develop uh, the vaccine application? Um, what were some of the responses and some of the challenges that we had? And then also, what do we do to kind of prevent it that were not pharmacologic? So in other words, things were not done for, through medications and not done through vaccines, but how do we control the spread? So we spent a lot of time trying to do that. And I think that just kind of giving you our experience and our example of how it evolved for us, it'll help get, have an experience of kind of how the science evolved and kind of had an impact in terms of the practical step went behind. I'm not saying this, that this is the only way to have ever done this, um, but this is kind of how it sort of evolved and what our experience was to try to deal with something that was certainly unprecedented in this past century and that any living person had been able, had, had gone through but just trying to learn from it and to try to see what would be the next steps and what are some of the lessons learned. Because as, as I said at a talk that I did last week, the only thing worse than tragedy is a tragedy wasted. So there's a lot of lessons that we should learn from this and try to figure out what the next steps will be. So um, this has become my, uh, my motto uh, in terms of uh, what goes on. So hopefully um, you'll kind of see where things are, but let's just kind of talk about a little bit from the background in terms of just the coronavirus, just to rehash. I know we all went through this and experienced this relatively recently, but I think it's worth kind of going over the history. So what was really unique about, or not unique, but what was really important about the coronavirus is that the coronavirus, like its other, the other four human coronaviruses that were out, was spread through the air. That was really evident because it's hard to get super spreader events that are not spread through the air or through water or something that would be that we would all ingest very quickly in large numbers. But the airborne spread aspect was a big deal. And obviously that's what led to all the different steps. Think about Ebola, when Ebola happened, the most recent big outbreak in 2014, um, that was something that never, never really made it to the rest of the world because of the way it was spread. It was spread through blood and body fluids contact. 
So that'll take more time. It's not something that's gonna give you this explosive sort of a spread. So you see with large crowds, this photo taken at an airport just shows the big movement of people is gonna be where the, how this actually could happen where you can get widespread uh, kind of transmission of the virus. And also at the end of the day, what really matters is how it impacted individuals. Right, so one of the things that um, kind of is an important thing about emerging pathogens, new infections, <clears throat> is that our bodies do its best to learn how to fight an organism, right? So most people, you know, that get a cold don't die from the cold because we've been trained and our immune system's been trained over time to sort of tame that virus, right? Or the viruses that cause the common cold. In addition to that, you also have the fact that from an evolution standpoint, it's in the virus best interest not to kill the host, right? So it just tries not to kill who it's infecting because that way it can't spread because it's a dead end at that point. It sounds kind of crazy and I'm kind of giving the virus sort of like this evil scientist kind of mindset, but it really doesn't do that. It just does that just by selection and over time, that's what happens. So this is kind of the, the, the worst outcome that happens, right? So most people who got COVID even early on got a cold or a bad flu, um, but then this is the dreaded outcome that we worried about. And this, X, this is a uh, chest x-ray for those you may not be familiar, and the heart here in the middle, these are the lungs, but all these sort of white spots, the lungs should be more blackish gray. All this is inflammation in the lungs. This person has COVID and is in the ICU and has the condition called ARDS or adult respiratory distress syndrome. This was the dreaded complication that led to people dying from COVID and still to this day, is causing that, but nowhere near the same numbers initially. To give you an idea from a practical standpoint, what we as physicians experience, and I'm a, even though I'm in the infectious disease public health world, my training is actually in pulmonary medicine. And in the ICU, when you would see these patients, you would put them on a ventilator. You can see the tip of the respirator tube right here, what's called the endotracheal tube here inside the trachea. Um, it's you start, you're ventilating the lungs that are like bricks. They don't expand, they turn to rock. And so trying to get oxygen into that is a big challenge. And then that's usually how people would die. It's from respiratory failure. We don't have the ability to give them the oxygen that they need. Um, and so that was a big challenge globally. And it was a big challenge, obviously, for us in the US for a variety of reasons. But let's talk a little bit about to kind of review some of the things. And this is kind of um, some of the background that you've heard. And I want to clarify some of the misconceptions, because as time has gone on, we've gotten a little bit more data. So first, a little background. The CDC, WHO, scientists all over the world, people that study emerging diseases have always recognized the danger that comes from infections spreading from animals to humans and humans back to animals. But we're most concerned about animals to us. And those are called zoonotic infections, zoo meaning kind of from animals and then kind of infecting us afterwards. Those infections are really the majority of infections that are the most important pathogens in humans, say almost the most important. My day job is a tuberculosis doctor, so I'm gonna not slight my, uh, my, my chosen profession. But zoonotic infections include influenza, which when you look at like the biggest pandemics over the last 200 years have been influenza related. And when you look at the most recent ones, they've been um, coronaviruses. All of these are zoonotic infections. They either spread directly from animals to humans or they spread between animals and then get one human where there's a mutation and then it spreads. And so that whole concept led to the development of um, a, a discipline called One Health, where you're looking at not only the infections in humans or diseases in humans, but also how the interplay between humans, the environment and animals all affects our human health. And so we always knew that there would be something very bad would happen from transmission from animals, spread from animals to humans. And lo and behold, this is how this all works. So when a lot of people said, oh, this must have been something in a lab, this must have been an experiment gone bad, this must have been some sort of terrorist attack. All those things are possible from a tiny perspective. The reality is that just the odds are that this would happen naturally far outweighed the chances that this would be something created. Could this have been created? Yes, we now know that that is highly unlikely. But his, you know, theoretically, that if something else were to happen tomorrow or the year after or the two years from now, whatever it might be, those events could be terrorist related. They could be created by some rogue state. But the reality is that these things happen, I say, unnaturally. And I say unnaturally because it has to do with climate change. It has to do with how man impinges on the environment. It has to do with the seafood markets where you have a lot of wild animals that carry their own infections. You have large concentrations of humans with their own infections. 
And when viruses kind of commingle, you get the transmission of new viruses. So there's viruses that don't infect humans, but they have parts of viruses that are included with human viruses. You get the two to match, and then all of a sudden you get a new virus. And that's exactly what happened with SARS-CoV-2, right? So that was the virus that causes COVID and that spread like wildfire. And interestingly enough, so the seafood market was here, but when you look at kind of when it all started and um, there was actually data that showed that when they looked at satellite data and internet searches as early as I think it was September of 2019, the number of Google searches in that area of China for diarrheal diseases, shortness of breath, fever, um, skyrocketed. And then also in addition, around that same time, satellite imagery showed that the hospitals were packed in October. Um, so parking lots were full, there was a lot of activity. So something happened probably a lot earlier than December. So again, I don't wanna kind of get into kind of all the stuff that kind of went around with some of those things, but this is obviously something that was brewing for a little bit and then exploded um, afterwards. And again, with the globalization of our world today, we're only just less than 24 hours away, pretty much from any point in the globe. So we can't think of a disease being eliminated anywhere unless it's eliminated everywhere, right? No man is an island unto himself, and that's never been more true than today. So now I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit about our experience at UF, and please forgive me if it sounds a little bit sort of egocentric or very self-centered in this sense, but I think it's just kind of a good vehicle instead of kind of getting this whole kind of COVID experience that everybody had, but to just to kind of say what some of our challenges were in our own experience and kind of walk you through the weeds of what we went through, because I think it hits the highlights of many of the issues from our side of things. And I say our meaning public health and the medical side, as far as like how we approach this and some of the big challenges that we faced on our end to try to help kind of uh, tame this ugly beast. All right, so one of the things um, here is that was the big challenge was trying to say, how do we get people back to work? So remember that we had the lockdown and everybody shut down, right? But then the university can't stay shut down. Right, so you've got a bunch of activities. So on the Gainesville campus, there are um, 23,000 essential personnel, right? So that's just staff and other people that kind of make the place work. And then we had to then say, okay, we compared that down to 7,000 during the lockdown, but then we had to start bringing people back with the idea that somehow we've got to run a university and we can't hide forever. And also just backing up a little bit, the whole idea behind a lockdown um, was to buy yourself enough time to get the tools that you need to be able to fight against what you need to. But lockdown was never an idea or a strategy to kind of say, oh, we're going to hide from this for a little while until it goes away or until something else happens. No, it's giving you time to do the things to coexist with the virus until definitive cures and definitive treatments are in place. So that's a whole other kind of discussion that could go on for a long time, but I won't go into the weeds on that. But the reality is that that's what we tried to do. And then the idea is that we knew we had to come out. So we had to come up with a plan to come back. So the idea was that we started developing this program and it's a long story, but I was asked by the university to kind of lead the effort to kind of with the return to work, return to campus. And then that kind of blossomed and grew from there. Now, one of the big challenges that we had that we kind of take for granted is that, oh, I think I might have diabetes. I'll go to get tested to get for diabetes. You know, I was in contact with my brother-in-law who has the flu. Maybe I have the flu. I'm going to go get tested to see if I need to take Tamiflu or some other medicine. You could just, we take it for granted in our country that you can go get tested for something and come back with an answer. But what about if it's a new disease? There were no tests for the first several months. There was no way to get them commercially. And so at UF, we had the ability to develop a test to be able to start doing it. Not FDA approved, not ready for prime time yet, but it was a tested test that was developed in the lab that was then we started applying it to the community both to do it both on campus but then trying to use it as much as we could in the community. Um, we couldn't get any swabs so we ran out of swabs. So what did the really brilliant engineers and bioengineering people that uh, I had the privilege of working with, they came up with, they, they made their own swab. The swab on the left is a commercially available swab which was used, I'm sure all of you had this pleasurable experience that done to you at least uh, once. Um, so they made this other one on the right made out of dental resin. So there was a 3D printed uh, swab that was developed. And one of our problems when we started testing, not just faculty in the university community, but when we started to move out into the general community, as you'll see momentarily, that we were the only ones who had swabs because we were making our own. And they were validated, they were worth uh, doing. It was just an amazing process. 
So one of the things that really kind of gets forgotten is this sort of innovation that kind of went into this. You had people in other places making ventilators, developing masks, creating all these things that just didn't exist before to just kind of make things on the fly. Now, you can have a very serious discussion about why we had to do that to begin with. That's a whole other discussion. But the fact is, is that, you know, what is it? Necessity is the mother of invention. And that clearly happened with us. But one of the big things that happened for us at UF that kind of drove things is that the governor wanted to um, get UF engaged in the community. And we were certainly willing and interested in doing that. But for those of you who may be familiar with the villages, the villages um, had um, was um, just been their hospital had just been bought by UF Health and UF Health had been starting to work in the area. And the governor said, I want you guys to start working in the community down at the villages because at the time, seniors were at the greatest risk and still remain to this day at, at significant risk um, compared to the general population. But that risk was super high among seniors because evidence from Italy and from other places that saw the, saw the virus first really showed that to be true. So we became engaged with the effort to work in the villages. So what we did is we innovated some more. So we got our workforce of what did we have? We had medical students, right? So the medical students were off. They weren't allowed to go to class. So we kind of recruited them and brought them on board, trained them how to swab. Um, I got swabbed more than I want to admit from medical students learning how to swab. So I really got the brain biopsy. I think uh, one weekend when we were training them, I got over 50 swabs, yay. My nose is big, but not that big. And so it was just uh, quite a, an ordeal to get that done. But what we did is that we really got people excited and felt like we were fighting back. And I think also I'll talk a little bit about some of the mental health issues, but one of the things that was really important at this stage, this was, I think in um, April, um, no, late March and into early April. But one of the important things was having something to fight back with. And a very big part of public health and any type of community-based campaign is sort of this you got to have a tool. You got to have. You got to get people behind you. You've got to communicate what the risk is. Talk straight with people. Treat them like adults, and just say these are difficult choices. This is what we're going to do, and why. And so we tried to do that as much as we could as we were moving forward. Um, yes, you know the villages is known for their golf carts, so we commandeered a bunch of these and got our team out and actually had people come in and test it on the polo fields. So at a time when it was very difficult to get any test done anywhere, we had tested. I think. I think we ended up with like 7,000 seniors um, tested in the villages that were higher risk and were concerned about their symptoms. And I'll tell you from being there testing myself and you know, or part of that effort and, and doing the, some of the testing myself and talking to people, it was amazing. As many of you may recall, it's just they just wanted to get a test, right? They, they just had this mindset, even though biologically and public health wise, we know that the value of that is relatively minimal, but people wanted to know if someone cared enough to come and they wanted to know, do I have it now? And that peace of mind mattered, even though medically and biologically it mattered, even though you could get infected tomorrow or the day after, but it really opened up the door for us to be able to build trust and to really get a tool in there and to innovate. Because when we learned, what we learned about testing on a massive scale, we then applied to vaccinating on a really massive scale. So in other words, it's always a learning process and you're always just kind of pushing and communicating, pushing and communicating and trying to keep people on board. And, and again, this, I love this picture. So we had these young medical students, idealistic, kind of out there with their N95s working in, uh, at the time, pretty warm days, and uh, just getting out to do as much as we could. And again, the important thing here is just with community engagement. So we spent a lot of time not just working there, but we also try to work in the rest of the, the communities as well, where UF Health uh, works. And so one of the key things that we developed was a health, partner, a health department partnership. Um, I've worked in tuberculosis control and public health my, my whole career. And so the uh, connections with the health department have been there for 25 years. So it was great to be able to kind of reach out and say, all right, what are we going to do? And so it was like a no brainer. There was no conversation about negotiating. It was just like, all right, I got this. You got that. Let's work on this together. And that was extremely, extremely helpful. And so what we did is we made that available for our at-risk, the testing for our at-risk populations as well. And so we didn't charge, we didn't do anything, we just, just do it, we had volunteers. And we grew our workforce from that first kind of effort at the villages where we got, I think 140 um, students to volunteer and rotate and kind of spend time coming and going as well as nurses and other doctors that would be there. Um, we even had the vice president for health affairs come out one day and, and swab uh, people with us. Um, that workforce grew tenfold over the course of the pandemic. 
we had over 1,400 volunteers and employees working to help us get this done. 1,400 volunteers plus employees to make that work. It was an amazing overall effort. And we took it everywhere. Again, we went to UF Health has a big component in downtown Jacksonville. Um, here we are in an urban uh, setting and also with um, um, sort of a, a subsidized housing where there was a lot of concentration of people at high risk. So subsidized housing, people at risk, because we knew that uh, people of African-American descent plus diabetes plus hypertension really put them at extreme risk. And so therefore testing there was a way that we wanted to get in. And also that gained trust. So that when we turn around and say, we have this vaccine, because we, we knew or we had faith that we were going to have a vaccine and knew that people really were working diligently to make that happen. We even went door to door um, and tested people, even though the limits of a single test, we look back and then go, how naive? And But we weren't naive. We knew that it was limited. We communicated that it was limited, but it gave us a chance to have face time with people, to know that somebody cared, that they're not on their own and that we're working to be able to kind of move and get new things in place. And then that trust was critical. We even went to Cedar Key and kind of did an ex experiment of sorts where we really knew in Cedar Key, um, where we had the anesthesia department that came and we did a lot of drawing blood to see if anybody had been exposed there an island with one way in. So they kind of closed out their island when they locked down and we kind of tested before and after the opening and kind of saw what the different rates of infection were. And also we just kind of used what we learned on campus with Screen Test and Protect. That was the name of the program. And my philosophy was, is that it's not something just for UF, right? UF is part of a community. So we just blurred the lines between what's university, what's community, and did everything we could to kind of reach out to UF's communities. And UF is big. I didn't realize, but UF is there. Are, when we were testing people in the uh, UF database, there are 123,000 people that are part of the UF family. That includes folks from the Whitney lab all the way down to the dental clinic down in Miami. Did you know UF has a dental clinic in Miami? UF has a dental clinic in Miami. And so connect with them and their surrounding communities and do what we could to help with them. And we did everything. What we were very proud of is that we really did a comprehensive approach. And because of our background and working in public health, we knew all the different tools that we had. We did surveillance testing to kind of see what the rates were in different populations. Um, we did symptom screening questionnaires that everybody that was on UF were able to get this and kind of say, I have symptoms, then do this, this, and this. I don't have symptoms, do this. I can get testing where? And it kind of gave them all that information. We also did um, targeted testing of high risk groups. Um, so we did everything that we could to kind of hit groups that later on on campus, we saw certain individuals and certain groups of individuals on campus were at higher risk. We made sure that we tested them more regularly. We also did something called wastewater epidemiology, or in other words, we just would test the wastewater in coming out of certain buildings and can detect the virus in the, in the sewer. Um, and then that would tell us you need to do more testing here because there's cases that are identified there as well. And we also did a lot of research, in other words, what we call operational studies, where we just look to see what's working, what isn't working, and how is that making a, a difference. All right, so one of the things, I love this uh, slide, because one of the things I was amazed by, and to me, it kind of reflected the fact that people wanted control. And a lot of people, especially in the university community, are driven by data, the numbers. So people were obsessed with the charts. They were obsessed with the numbers. How are you counting the numbers? What is going on? And it, to be honest with you, it's a true confession here. It drove me insane. It's like, well, at two o'clock, you said there were 1,475 people that tested positive this week. But then when I looked at three o'clock, that number was two people less. How could that be? I said, I don't know. It says we're doing the best we can. This is how it's set up. And so we, what we wanted to get and what we wanted from our perspective were not the precise numbers because most people in public health, like myself, I'm not a tree guy. I'm a forest guy. I couldn't tell you a tree if I was standing right in front of me. It's like, it's the forest. I look at the whole forest. There are trees in that forest, but I don't really care about the bark. I really care about everything else that's in front of me. And so what we did with these numbers, we generated epidemic curves. And I can tell you from the curve what was happening when, and we knew what we needed to do. So this big spike here that was in September of, actually, I'm trying to think of the, that was the first, that was September of 20. So the makes it look like 2001, but that's actually the first of the month. This big spike was Labor Day weekend um, in the, for the first Labor Day weekend of September of, of 2020. And then you can see that this second spike here was when the bars opened up. Um, so that was another spike that opened up and we had a huge surge in cases on campus when the bars opened up. 
And then all this, this, this particular one here was spring break. So there's all these different spikes that we can relate to different activities of what was going on. And it allowed us to then dig in deeper about what interventions, how we can staff, how we can approach, how we can educate, and then be able to kind of deal with things as they came along. These are just a graph of some of the numbers. But what we did too is that we really scaled up. When we first started testing, it was a huge deal to say that we could do up to 200 tests a day. That was like, wow. By the time our program really got rolling, we were doing 3,000 tests among surveillance testing per day. And then when you do the clinical tests and the tests in the hospital, we were up to 5,000 per day. Um, so just really the output was amazing of how fast it went. And we drove the cost down from each test. I forget what the, the total number was, but down our cost got down to below like $5. It was crazy how much we were able to kind of innovate and change and a great partnerships with the labs where, the, where I like to say the really smart people were. And again, as much of what we were doing is that we were kind of thinking and thinking, and we left no stone unturned. And because of that, we had contact with a lot of national media, and then also the National Institutes of Health, other places had kind of reached out to us about, how are you doing this? We'd been featured in a few different um, sort of media outlets, as well as some um, um, higher, chronicled higher education about the other journals about what we were doing and why. Um, and so we used that, and we were always the whole time planning and saying, okay, we're going to get a vaccine. We need to be ready. We need to be ready. That's our. That's our, that's when we go on offense. This was all defense up until now. It's, Gators are going to have a great year this year, so I got to have the football reference in there. But we played defense to begin with, and then we moved to offense once we got the vaccine. Um, this incredibly complicated map. If you were, in case you were wondering and saying, "Wow, I wonder if he's going to show me a map of the sewers at the University of Florida." Well, here you have it. These are the maps of all the sewers, and we would test. At the sites, uh, I think we're testing at the green sites uh, to be able to test, and then we knew which buildings led to which, and then that allowed us to kind of d d uh, target our testing. Um, but also, we just continue to roll through the community, and then also what we did is that we used it as an opportunity to reach previously underserved communities. Um, to me, I, like I mentioned before, you might think I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in redemption, um, and to me, this was an opportunity for us to be able to do right by the community and to kind of work with the community and reach out in ways that we maybe not had before. So this allowed us to kind of reach out to those communities. So we work with a lot of the black churches on the east side of town in Gainesville. We work with uh, migrant uh, camps. We work with the rural, rural women's health project to really be able to get un marginalized populations to get into, get tested, because we knew that we wanted to get access to them vaccine wise. And we spent a lot of time on the news. We spent a lot of time doing town halls. We spent a lot of time doing talks like this. Uh, throughout the community to get people what we thought was high quality information, access to what we had, and to really just kind of believe what we were doing. And then the vaccine showed up. Um, and so it was just an amazing opportunity for those vaccines to come. And again, getting back to UF, we had applied what we had learned and we started with the first vaccines done in the garage. Nobody had ever said, why are you gonna get a vaccine in a garage? Because we can move people faster. And from an infection control standpoint, as you'll hear from uh, Dr. Prinz from, uh, from Cindy, she will tell you about the importance of controlling the spread of the infection and what you can do to do that. So our goal was to kind of move people, but then we moved eventually to the Touchdown Terrace. Any Gator fans here will recognize that area. And we started to move patients through there and then focused on the uh, elderly at this point initially and other high-risk groups. And then we continue to move also to the uh, African-American community where we really had great engagement where before uh, vaccination rates were in, around the country were probably about 50, 60%, we were able to, to match the vaccine rates in both East and West Gainesville. So in other words, the vaccine rates were, were equivalent and, and eventually those in the black churches uh, superseded everywhere else uh, in, the, in the country. And then we moved to the big time. We moved actually to within the uh, stadium itself and then we actually were able to get vaccines rolling. So we started from that initial 200 vaccines done in the uh, museum garage outdoors to uh, our peak during the um, initial phase when we really opened up vaccines to everyone. We were doing 5,000 a day. Um, so it was just amazing that we moved that many people through a vaccine to be able to do basically 5,000 medical procedures in a day. We did 5,000 a day for that first week when vaccines were available. It was, it was an amazing moment and probably one of the highlights of my career. But I'll go ahead and pause. I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Cindy, who's going to talk to you about her area is going to be infection control and some of the other aspects that we uh, discussed. Thanks, Mike. All right, let's see if I got this down pat now. I think so. So 
Um, just by background, I started out my career as a virologist, and I had come to University of Florida initially as a postdoc in virology, actually studying vaccinia virus, which is a pox virus. And as I was going through it, I thought, mm, I'm not sure I want to do this for a career to actually be doing this type of research, especially because I was looking at biotech, and I wasn't sure it was my thing. And I was uh, fortunate to be able to do my Master of Public Health in Epidemiology, and I went from there into something called infection prevention and control. And it's one of these things where someone sent me a job ad. I'd never heard of it before I had to Google it. So I didn't know what I was applying for. I didn't know what I was getting into, but it wound up really being a passion of mine. And I did that for four years at UF Health Shands and then went and became a faculty member in epidemiology um, about 12 years ago now. And so I tell you that because my role in screen test and protect and a lot of what I did even sort of outside the program was campus infection control. So infection control in a hospital setting is about protecting patients, making sure that they don't get an infection in the hospital, they don't spread an infection to other people if they already have it, and then also keeping our healthcare workers safe and making sure that they don't get an infection. And so it's a combination of things. It's a lot of looking at education, looking at surveillance and things like that, but then it's also working within the environment and figuring out how do you protect people, you know, so that they're not getting infected from the ceiling tiles, the construction that's going on from the airspace, is the airflow correct? And so, you know, there were a lot of things that even though this had really traditionally been within a hospital setting, were applicable to other settings during COVID. And so that's where I kind of came in. I was um, initially when the pandemic started, I helped out a little bit, but I was doing our college's reaccreditation process, which is not fun. Um, and I had the opportunity to help write a position description for the infection preventionist for screen test and protect. And as I was writing it, I thought, mm, no, I wanna do this. So I wound up um, deciding that I was gonna dedicate some of my effort to do that. So. So um, one thing that I did in infection control as we were trying to come back to campus was help with some of the event planning. So, you know, my mindset at the time as someone who worked in the hospital was prevent infection at all costs, right? We do everything we can, honestly. I'm sure some people have had these experiences of hospital associated infections. We do everything we can though to prevent those infections from happening. And so we have a very low risk tolerance within the hospital setting. And I had to change my mindset a little bit when I came into this infection control position. And one of the first things was working with our um, student affairs group. And as we were coming back to campus, someone said, well, we wanna have a movie night at the Odom at our basketball stadium. And I was like, Oh, it's a lot of people piled into the stadium. And, you know, I think one of the seminal things that someone said to me um, was, you know, if we don't give them something to do, they're going to go find something to do. And it's not going to be controlled. It's not going to be something we necessarily want students doing. And so that really changed me a little bit to think about, okay, let's do things that we can. Let's try to minimize the risk while we're doing it, but we're not going to be no risk. No risk is sitting at home and not being able to do anything. So, so this was our movie night at the Odome. You know, we, we had a good plan in place. We had people, um, students were within bubbles. So they did have initially um, their, their groups that they were with and then their bubbles sat together. We knew where they were sitting. So if we did have an outbreak, we were going to be able to contact trace them. And then the other thing we did was, you know, much to the being of a lot of people, they said, you know, we want everyone to wear a mask. And because of that, we don't want to offer food because the first thing people do when they get food is take off that mask, put it in their lap. And that's sort of the end of people wearing a mask. So you know, remember, this is early on. We had no vaccines. We didn't have a good idea of, you know, exactly the spread. We knew it was airborne. We knew it was um, that much more so than contact, but we still wanted to have precautions in place. And so that went well. And, you know, in time, as we got more and more requests, I was working with our student affairs group um, to come up with an events policy. And this looks kind of complicated, but the idea here is that let's think about events in terms of risk. So whenever someone's requesting to do something, let's think about where does it fall on the risk scale 
Um, you'll see if you can read it from there. I don't know if you can, but at the bottom there's playing instruments. And you know, Mike and I went over to the music school and worked with them to try to figure out how to limit the risk while they were still trying to, you know, teach their students and create music. And it was something people needed. And so, you know, the the prevailing notion became green is great. If you're in the green zone, you know, you're probably going to get approved to do your event. If you're in the yellow zone, let's talk about what you want to do. Let's think about is the risk going to be worth the reward? And it didn't mean that it was going to be a no. And then if you fell in the red zone, we worked with the group to try to get to yellow or to green. So, you know, we tried very hard along the way to get to yes. And there were very few things that we actually said no to. Um, and I think the nice thing is, you know, Mike was leading Screen Test and Protect. I was working a lot with him. And we were really able to, I think, come together and agree on how things would work. So this, this actually worked out pretty well, I think, along the way. And so this was, this was sort of a, a pet project for me, I think, because this is Dance Marathon. And so this is a fundraiser for Children's Miracle Network. We have students who do this, hundreds and hundreds of students who do this every year. They pile into the O'Connell Center usually, and they raise a lot of money for this charity by dancing for 24 hours straight, staying on their feet. Well, that's a harder to think, thing to do during COVID. The first year of the pandemic, they had to go virtual and that was really tough for them to do. And so in that second year of the pandemic, worked really hard with this student run group to figure out how they could make this happen. And it wasn't what it had been in the years before, but it did actually happen. So there was a dance marathon um, and this is obviously, oops, sorry. This is um, Mike and myself, and this is Nancy Crystal Green, who's in um, student affairs. And we had actually just run over from one of the vaccine clinics to drop in and visit while they were doing dance marathon. And then another thing that I was responsible for was space assessments. So again, thinking about how do we minimize the risk of infection within places. So we talked about events, but now it's more about the where. And this was one place that I went. So Mike mentioned UF is really neat. There's all these places that I didn't know about even having already been on this campus since 2001. Um, so one place I went was the UF Sensory Laboratory and they do taste testing there. And so people will go in and they'll sit down at their little booth and there's a garage door at the inside of that little desk. And then someone will give them something to taste and then they'll get some feedback on the computer about what they thought about it. And so they wanted to start back up and we figure out a plan for how to do that, how to space it out. They already had these partitions in between. I'm not a great fan of partitions, but it wasn't going to hurt. And so we were able to get them moving again as well. This is the UF Small Animal Hospital. So here's another thing, you know, my kind of human centric practice I wasn't thinking about. And it wasn't that we were worried about the animal to human transmission in this case, but if you look at these folks, they work really closely together. I never appreciated how much they have to kind of get near each other in order to take care of some of these small animals. And so we were seeing infections within the vet school and worked with them to figure out how to minimize that, you know, to put them in better masks before anyone was really recommending N95s or KN95s for everyone and to think about some of their spaces and what they could do to stay safer. And, you know, these are folks that I don't think um, we all realize, you know, they work overnight, they work all the time and, you know, we rely on them when we need them for our pets. So it was nice to help them keep going as well. This is one of our beautiful chemistry labs on campus. So part of what we did with Screen Test and Protect was as they were seeing people who are getting infections, we knew where they were in class. And so we could get an alert that, you know, it seems like there's an unusual number of cases associated with a certain class. And I would go and observe and see what was going on. And in this case, these folks were doing perfectly. <laughs> they were completely spread out. I kind of observed just quietly at first. And then I went in and I talked to the instructors and I saw what the students were doing. And, you know, I could at least say, well, they're not coming from there. The infections aren't coming from there. It's probably just an association that some of these students may know each other outside of class. So it was helpful to be able to bring that observation forward. 
And then we have a lot of athletic facilities as well and our athletics needed to keep going. So this is the um, women's gymnastics practice gym. So this is just one example, but went into multiple athletic facilities to also think about how can our teams practice? How can even sports summer camps and things keep going while we're in the middle of a pandemic? And then I got to visit here as well. So this was a real joy to come to Whitney Labs to make uh, a new friend, many new friends, and to get to think about, you know, they were trying to restart their tours at the time, um, thinking about also their own educational programs, and then even the Evenings at Whitney series. And then um, my last sort of role was in occupational health. So this is really more back to my infection control roots, but it's broader than that. So we had a, a workforce, right? We have students who are in physical therapy, occupational therapy. We have students in medical school who are in public health programs. We have students who, if we needed them, whether it was going to be to go into the hospital, to clean up, to move patients, whatever it was going to be, if we came to that point in the pandemic where our healthcare force was decimated, we had a workforce and we wanted to keep them going. And so part of this was to really work with these students if they were exposed back in the days when you had to quarantine still, if they were exposed, we worked out a plan where they could get series of tests and not actually have to quarantine as long as they were continuing to mask and test negative. And that kept them going in their own roles. And honestly, it helped benefit their education as well because that's a lot of hands-on education that you can't miss by staying home. So, you know, these are multiple hospitals. Um, here's UF Health Jacksonville. This is um, UF Health Shands Hospital. This is the... Um, VA hospital in Gainesville, and then this is our student healthcare center. And, you know, it became a very complicated thing, um, you know, who was employed by whom and, and who was dealing with whom. But the nice thing was, again, we had sort of a community where we were working together to communicate what was going on, um, because we have a lot of healthcare workers who actually float between hospitals. And then um, Mike talked a little bit about the vaccine clinics, but I just wanted to speak a little bit about this as well as someone who, you know, when that vaccine was coming out, I was doing my infection control part. I hadn't really done anything with testing, but as someone who's been in public health for a long time, I wanted to be part of that vaccine initiative. I really wanted to, you know, help roll that out. And so um, what really struck me about doing this was, we had so many volunteers and we had so many students who were eager to help out. And really what this became was a living classroom for our students. So, you know, again, this is sort of a silver lining to a terrible thing, but we had students who have learned so much about public health that hopefully will take us into the future and help with the next pandemic because, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be here, right? And Mike's not going to be here, but, you know, that 20-year-old student is still going to remember that experience and hopefully be able to lead when the next pandemic comes along. So these were some of our students from Screen Test and Protect. And actually this student right here, she worked with me in occupational health. Her name is Reagan and she went into infection control. Um, we have nursing students. These are our pharmacy students. Um, shout out to um, Shauna Burring from the College of Pharmacy, um, who was at all of these vaccine clinics supervising these student volunteers to pull vaccine all day long. It was a pretty tedious job that they had to do. And then um, back here, so I just want to also give a little bit of a shout out. Um, because this is um, Megan Froman and she, along with Matt Walzer, were really instrumental in running these vaccine clinics. I lost a lot of sleep doing this, trust me. And what I really love is Megan was my former student and then sort of became my own, you know, supervisor, mentor at the vaccine clinic. So it was really a nice give and take that way. All right. And so this is part of our volunteer um, group, so that is not nearly all who were there, but um, again, you know, I think that hopefully these are the people, these younger people who learn so much who are going to lead us through the next pandemic. So I'm going to kind of go into the, the next section about 
consequences in the future, and then we'll we'll take uh, take your questions. So we kind of had the community efforts, and uh, we did a little bit of everything. So no, this didn't really happen, but um, we tried everything we could uh, to kind of reach out to the community. So we tried some things that worked, and some that didn't. Um, actually, went to try to get. Uh, one population was very low in accessing were uh, young uh, African Americans. So we actually went to a, a concert. I didn't really wear these clothes; it's kind of Photoshop. But anyway, so we went, and that that didn't work so well. And we tried other things that didn't, and some that did. But like a lot of things in community efforts, we just kept trying to see what would what would work. And so it's interesting is that many of the biggest challenges that we face. I think I needed to remember this this quote: um, "There's nothing new under the sun except the history you don't know." I think I'd read that from Harry Truman, but Truman wasn't the originator of it. But a lot of the resistance and reluctance about vaccines actually came from the very day that Edward Jenner developed vaccines uh, from cows and getting cowpox and using that and seeing the efficacy of cowpox against um, smallpox. And there are all these fears that would turn you into an animal and all these things that seem very strange until we heard some of the strange things that we heard during our time. And again, getting it closer to just the past century, um, there's always gotta be somebody to blame. So this was around the time of uh, the, the Spanish flu uh, during the great influenza in the 1920s and late, uh, right after World War I. And then also you can see here that, uh, you know, again, we were just at war with Germany. And so obviously the Germans are responsible for this. And so there's uh, just a lot that happens. And we longed for the days where it was kind of like where many of you probably um, had your polio vaccine um, and, you know, kind of the time where you had trusted sources of information, probably most of us in this room, except a, a few of us didn't, uh, didn't know who Walter Cronkite was, but you would see the news and Walter Cronkite, you trusted him, you trusted him and kind of got your information and said, I'm going to, this is what's happening. I'm going to get my vaccine. It makes sense. And there are some people that were against it, but it was nowhere near what we faced. And despite the fact that you had a disease that had incredible mortality, incredibly high numbers of people were dying when you looked at just the sheer numbers, especially initially, you had a lot of people that just really clung on to beliefs that really you didn't even know where they came from. And it wasn't really limited to one country or another. This is a global phenomenon. So this is a woman protesting in Spain. Her sign in Spanish says, no vaccines, no 5G, and no masks. So apparently she has something against good cell service as well. But one thing is that that no 5G related to cell service is not unique. That's actually tied to this sort of urban legend myth kind of disinformation campaign that somehow <clears throat> the vaccines were related to 5G networks and that the big telecompanies were making money off of the vaccines and created this whole thing that didn't really exist. So all these things with no basis in science, no basis in data or information or anything that's based on anything, just someone with a computer and someone with a program be able to kind of generate massive amounts of disinformation that lead to huge movements. We also had things where there's legitimate discussion and, and discord about what to do. And again, a lot of that could have been the communication from federal agencies and from local agencies could have been better as far as like the benefits and the limits to the use of masks, the benefits of using them, why we would do them and to communicate that better. But also the odds were stacked against us in public health to be able to communicate that because there was so much information that went way too fast and way too much before. We just weren't prepared to really deal with it. And then you had people that really just undermined many of our public health efforts. And again, people died. Lots of people died that didn't need to for a variety of different reasons. And obviously a lot of the divisiveness in the world took off. But an important thing to remember is that this is a paper that's published here. And if you want to keep the references, we'll make the slides obviously avail available. But one of the things that folks don't realize is just how fast this moves and why it moves so fast. And use the example, I mentioned Ebola earlier, but in the Ebola outbreak um, in 2014 and a subsequent smaller one, there was information that was generated by bots. And I'm gonna sound like a conspiracy theorist here, but a lot of them were originated from Russian um, hackers that would create these bots, these internet programs that kind of roam the internet to create disinformation and kind of spread information in different networks. These bots were able to kind of move forward and spread disinformation to such an extent during the Ebola outbreak that when certain information would go out, that they actually went out and killed public health workers that were, that were dealing with the Ebola outbreak. And although we didn't have anything quite that extreme, we had a lot of those things that did happen. And I will tell you that I had people make threats to me just for doing public health and being a doctor. Um, 
just strange that people would send flowers to my house and say, we know where you live. So again, it's just, this, this is the United States. This, this shouldn't happen, but it, but it did. And a lot of the things in terms of like, when you look at where things go and you can see the point here about 5G cellular networks, these are all things that were kind of pushed by Russian sort of originating programs that kind of roamed the internet that really sent out lots of disinformation. And one in particular that really affected us was one that said that these vaccines are gonna make young women infertile. Well, what's the, what's the core most common group of nurses that work in hospitals? Young women, many of whom are childbearing age. What was one of the biggest groups of people that are initially that had reluctance about getting vaccines amongst professionals in the healthcare field? Young women who were nurses. So again, these came from direct links to these disinformation campaigns that just take like a tick on a dog. I mean, it's just, you can't get them off and you can't stop them. So again, these are things that we in public health have to develop tools and in medicine have to develop tools to counter this because this is effective. This leads to people dying. This is destabilizing. This is not good. And COVID is not as bad as it could have been. We kind of got lucky. Right, so the next pandemic may not be so easy, in quotes, to deal with. And there are consequences. Um, so a lot of this had a price for the healthcare workforce. You know, I can tell you working in public health, almost all of my TB nurses that I work with, tuberculosis nurse in the health department are all different. They all rotated. A lot of tuberculosis people got pulled to do COVID because it's a respiratory illness, you wear masks. It's kind of, this is what the TB people do. And they do a lot of the outreach and the contact tracing. And so a lot of them got pulled and suffered the consequences. It's hard to, we, we have a nursing shortage. There are all these consequences that kind of happen. And in terms of the mental health impact on physicians, nurses, um, frontline healthcare workers is staggering when you really think about the overall consequences. I won't read through all of these numbers here, but this was in uh, March, April of 2021 that had all these. When you've got almost 10% of public health workers thinking suicidal thoughts, you have a big societal problem. And a lot of this has to do with communicating, communicating information, what is true, what is not, what is news, what is not, what is really useful information, what is myth, what is legend. These are things that none of us were really prepared to deal with and really were overwhelmed with that in terms of just being able to respond to it appropriately. Um, but hope came, right? So I don't wanna be all Debbie Downer and kind of talk about all the negative things is that science was able to prevail in a lot of ways where we developed the vaccines, which leave a lot to be desired, but they're incredibly effective and they stopped us from dying in the numbers that people did. They're very effective to stopping the worst consequences of the illness. They don't last very long. You can get reinfected. You have that issue, a combination of natural infection with vaccines is probably best. It's not perfect, but it stopped people from dying in the numbers that they were. Paxlovid does the same. These are medicines that you take usually preferably within 48 hours of being diagnosed, but they're beneficial, I think, to up to several days, five days, if I'm not mistaken, of being diagnosed and developing symptoms, that they too reduce death. The study that came out recently showed a drop death risk by 76 or 78%. So we've got tools and we've got things that move forward. And obviously the vaccines work, but what we really need is gonna be a better vaccine. So the next generation COVID vaccines are gonna help, um, not a whole lot, but they're gonna help. Um, but then what we really need is a dramatic shift to be a, what's called a universal coronavirus vaccine. So the worst sort of spreading uh, viruses that we've had recently were MERS-CoV that started Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, and then also the original SARS that started out uh, like 2001, 2003, I think 2003. Um, that those are coronaviruses and then a universal vaccine would cover all of them. And that's one of the more likely viruses that would break out from the animal kingdom. And I love this quote. It's, it's attributed to Winston Churchill, but there's no proof that he actually said it. But uh, Americans can always be counted on to do the right thing eventually and only after exhausting all of their possibilities. And, and Winston Churchill felt like he could say that because his mother was American and he really was a big uh, American file, I guess, I don't know if that's even a word, but anyway, he was very much pro-American. Um, and I think that that's where I'm hopeful, that I think that we'll eventually get our stuff together, that we'll be able to kind of solve some of these issues that divide us and some of these issues that really address in terms of what's true, what's facts and how people can understand and, and gain trust back in experts. 
Um, it's just the thought that someone who just saw something on the internet five minutes ago can come to me and say, that's not true. You made that up. And I've been doing this for 25 years and gave the best years of my life to studying. And you just undermine me. I remember I was at a school board meeting where I was explaining something. I, I think I communicate rather well. And I was kind of to the point. It's like, this is why we need to do X, Y, and Z. And I had someone come on and say, I just looked on the internet and all that's wrong. This is what's true. And that was it. And he had the same amount of airtime that I did. And yet that's okay. I, you know, it's like, I, I, I don't, I'm not Mr. Know-it-all and I, I'm, I'm willing to be humble and kind of say there are things I don't know and I get things wrong, but there's something wrong when we don't trust experts. So again, we're wrong plenty of times, but there's a lot more. So I think in terms of what's next, I'm, I'm hopeful for the future. Um, I think that there's going to be new horizons and new things that we can do, but I think that we do need to deal with the communication, some of the divided, divisive kind of things. We need to get our act together in terms of controlling information. I took out some of the slides in the interest of time about social media, the toxicity, the poison that comes from that at times, but it can also be used for good. And we need to figure out how to do that, do that better. But I think that working together, um, using the best that science has to offer, the best that the faith community has to work together in communities can really kind of bring ourselves together we can do great things, but I think it's something that if we don't make that effort, if we're not conscious and we play the victim, we're going to be victimized again. So there's hope for the future. There's going to be new vaccines. There's going to be new treatments. Things are going to keep getting better, but we need to learn from these lessons and kind of move forward. So um, with that, I think I will uh, thank you for your time and attention and uh, go Gators, but we'd be glad to take uh, any of your questions that you might have and any and all questions. So thank you very much. And Cindy, thanks.